Welcome to another edition of the magazine. Today we have with us Joel Gonzalez, and welcome to the show, Joel. Thank you, Charlie. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Welcome, uh, welcome to my home. This is great. <laughs> Thank you for inviting us in. Thank you. So tell us something about your background, where you grew up, and some of your education. Well, things started out in uh, New Bedford, actually. Uh, I was born in Dar uh, New Bedford, south end of New Bedford, and then my parents moved to South Dartmouth, and then we moved to the north end of New Bedford when the Surrey shop was opened okay. because it became a little inconvenient to drive from South Dartmouth to the north end of New Bedford, so they found a home not far from the shop. And uh, that's where I stayed till uh, I, I... Well, actually, we moved to a Krishna when okay. I was 11 years old, and I was there until I bought my first home in Dartmouth, and I've been in Dartmouth ever since, so... I, uh, it's been, a, it's been a, a, just a few places. A lot of people move around a lot, but I've never gone much further than a 10-mile radius from my original home. So it, it, this has been my home for my entire life. And you, uh, education? Well, I uh, started out in the, uh, in the north end of New Bedford at the Gyra Swift School and then spent a little time in the, in the John A. Parker School on County Street in New Bedford. Okay. At the time, they had an enrichment program there, and I was fortunate that uh, I qualified for it. Uh, they wanted to give me a double promotion from third grade to fifth grade, and my mother thought that wasn't a good idea because I'd be like 16 going into college. And uh, so they had this enrichment program at Parker School, so I was bused from the north end of New Bedford to Parker School on County Street. And then after that, I went to friend, fortunate enough to go to Friends Academy in Dartmouth and then uh, Tabor Academy in Marion. So I graduated from there finally in uh, 1976. Mm -hmm. And then I went off to Florida to uh, play golf at Rollins College just outside of Orlando. And that, that's funny because in, in those days, Disney World was the, the Magic Kingdom and that was it. And the Orlando airport was about the size of Providence <laughs> at, at the best. Uh, so it's uh, amazing when I tell that story to people that the Orlando airport was smaller than Providence is today. <laughs> uh, so those were great times and a lot of fun when people would come down and visit. Of course, I'd take them to Disney. Yeah. But the only thing that existed was the Magic Kingdom. A lot of fun. But it was a lot of fun even then. It sure was, yeah. As a matter of fact, it was probably more fun then than, it, than it is today because it, it wasn't the, the city that it is today. Sure. Sure. The hustle and bustle wasn't quite the same. And we were close to Cocoa Beach, so I spent a lot of time there and you know, of course, you're, you're in college in Florida. You have to head to the beaches, right, as a, an 18-year-old. So happen to have a lot of fun. Good days. Yes, thank you. That's great. Um, so your family. Uh, you have someone that I know very well, a member of your family. You do. Yep, my sweetheart daughter. Yeah. She loves, loves her job with you guys at MO Life. Yeah. And she uh, gets a lot of satisfaction from it, enjoys working with all the consumers, and um, enjoys it very much. So... And uh, I, you know, small world, and we end up getting to meet. I've heard a lot about you from her. Uh, so it's nice that we finally got to meet together. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Kylie is just, she's amazing. Thank she's you. Amazing. I, I think she is too, yeah. She's, uh, she had a nice education too. Went to Bridgewater State, was a, a speech pathology major. And uh, hasn't gone on with that since, but uh, she seems to love what she's doing with you guys now. So yeah. we'll see what the future will bring. Excellent. And yeah. the guys love her too. So yeah, <laughs> she's very well liked. Yeah, she sends me pictures of them and, uh, and, and they know me a little bit too. She tells them about me. So it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. So how did the Surrey shop begin? Well, that could take about an hour and a half, I guess, to tell that story. But um, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, in 1960, my parents, my father was a produce manager at Almax okay. in New Bedford. And my mother was an optometrist with, uh, with a doctor on, in downtown New Bedford. And they, they were, had nice little careers, but uh, maybe not fully satisfied, I guess. And my father was a tinkerer with wood. And he would make things in the cellar in, in our South End home at the time. Mm -hmm. And it was fun. And one day he made my mother a cranberry scoop because cranberries, of course, are so famous in this area. Right. A small cranberry scoop about that big and gave it to her as a gift. And she thought it was the coolest thing. And, uh, it, and they decided that maybe they could make these things as a, what we call today a side hustle mm -hmm. um, and have a bit of a side hustle. So that's what happened. He started making these cranberry scoops and then making bookends and making candle holders and all these things in the cellar. And then they would jump in the car on their days off and head to Cape Cod and pedal them out of the back of a station wagon with me in tow. <laughs> I was three years old at the time. And uh, my mother was the suave uh, salesperson, sure. and she would go into the shops and, and uh, 
talk to everybody and smooth them, smooth them all over. And my father was more of the, the, the bull, uh, rugged worker guy. And so he stayed out in the car with me. And that's how it all morphed. So they found that to be successful. And they found there weren't enough hours in a day to produce those things. So they ended up quitting their jobs and making this a job. Mm -hmm. And then they found a small gift and card shop, uh, which at the time was called Mary Lou's Card Shop on a cushion at Avenue. Um, and they, I think if the story I recall properly, they borrowed $9,000 on an insurance policy that they had, mm -hmm. and they bought this Mary Lou's card shop. And they're wonderful people. Their name were the Archambaults, Estelle Archambault. She was the owner, and she had a daughter named Mary Lou, and that's how Mary Lou's card shop evolved. And I'm still in touch with Mary Lou today on Facebook. Yeah. And uh, just before I closed the Surrey shop in 2016, she had come to visit and we talked old times, and uh, so, so it's really great. Some great things about social media, and, that, and that's one of them, to be able to keep in touch with people. She, she lives in Virginia now, and so that's how that all started. She was a little girl then, and I was a little boy, and yep. so I spent uh, the next uh, four years, three years in there just about every day, and in the back room, just keeping myself busy. I knew how to make change by the time I was five years old, <laughs> um, and working with customers, so I got that retail exposure. And then in 1965, uh, we had kind of outgrown that building. Uh, my parents were fortunate enough that the business had, had done so well that they needed a bigger space. So there was a building next door to us called Worthington's Bakery. Mm -hmm. And they ended up moving that building and building the Surrey shop that everyone probably remembers. Uh, if you're older, you remember the original Surrey shop also, but this one was a 4,000 square foot, much larger building. And now we started to carry furniture and lots of other accessories besides the things that my father made at the time. So it uh, really grew and took off and we had a lot of fun with it. We had uh, Stan Lip would do his uh, morning talk shows from our front window. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so that was a big draw. And then from then on, every year in, in uh, October, we opened on October 18th, 1965. That was my mother's birthday. And then every year thereafter, we celebrated on Columbus Day weekend with our annual grand opening sale. And uh, people would come in and we'd have coffee and pastry for everybody. And it was just, it was great days. Of course, this was before malls and the internet and the big box stores and all. So people shopped in their neighborhoods and appreciated the, the uh, unique service that you got in these, in these independently owned stores. So it was great days. We had to hire a police officer it, believe it or not, in a small independent store when we had our anniversary sale because we had, that, we had that much traffic and it was great, good days. Well, I remember one time I had to use the restroom and I was in the front of the store and I, ended up, I walked out the front door and came, went around the building and came in the back to use the restroom because it was easier than trying to fight the people to get to the back of the store. Right, That's right. how busy we used to be. That's so great. it's hard to believe that today when you tell people that, yeah. but that was really the truth. So those were great days. Well, it was a big draw. I remember even growing up, you know, hearing about oh, the Surrey shop, the Surrey shop. Yeah. You know, that was a big draw. And, you know, you even get your uh, gifts wrapped. We had free gift wrapping long before anybody else did. We had free delivery long before everybody else did. Uh, we did. We offered interior home design. My mother was great at that. And she would go along with another employee we had. His name was Donald at the time. And, and uh, they would go to people's homes and then and, uh, suggest all the accessories for them. And then, then they would buy them from the Surrey shop. So what people refer to today as interior designers or home stagers, we were doing that a long time ago. So uh, great days. Again, great memories of when, when you were able to thrive as a small independent business. Yes, absolutely. So as family businesses grow and move on, it becomes a lot of work. It sure does. Uh, it, was a, it was a lot of work then, and it, it was still a lot of work even when I finally closed the store. Uh, probably became even more work, actually, because it was just, again, now we were fighting big box stores, sure. malls. Mm -hmm. The Internet was kind of coming along strongly. Um, and I closed finally in 2016. But the last 20 years or so were difficult mm -hmm. because of the growth of the Internet and the, the Amazons of the world, uh, and, and again, the malls and the big box stores. When the Dartmouth Mall came along in 1971, it really didn't affect us that much. We were still very fortunate. But then the, the satellites, the strip malls, and, and then 20 years or so later, the, the internet. Uh, yeah. So it really changed things a lot. And now it's very difficult for small independent stores. I, I feel you almost have to be a hobbyist now to run an independent store. You have to be independently wealthy, 
Uh, you have to have a career that's behind you, maybe as a school teacher, for example, mm -hmm. and you, you're getting a pension, but you've always had this desire to run a little gift shop or that kind of thing. And but you can do that because you have the, the other to fall back on. Right. Right. Uh, but to put to feed your family from a small independent store today. Very, very difficult. Yeah. Very challenging because there are no vacation days. There are no sick days. Right. There are nope. no benefits. No, nope. <laughs> uh, you know, no retirement. So it's it's hard. You have to be there every day. <laughs> and you have to be there every day. I mean, there were many times when I would have a substantial 102 fever or so, and I was in that store. Tried not to let my customers know, because they probably wouldn't have been too happy that I was at work like that, but you had no choice. You had no choice. You yeah. really, they, you couldn't pick up the phone. When I picked up the phone to call in sick, I got a busy signal, <laughs> <laughs> because I was calling my own house. Right, so, right. Uh, yeah, so it was different. Uh, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. It was a great, great experience, great work ethic experience. Yeah, and great memories. Yeah, and, and wonderful memories. I mean, how many people get to work with their parents for many years like that and, um, and make a living doing it and meet all the amazing people I've met uh, over, over my life? And, and it's still going on today with Surrey Jewelry Services. So tell us about this new adventure, Joel, that you're, that you're doing now. Well, it's, uh, it's, it was morphed from the Surrey shop. That's where the name came from, Surrey Jewelry Services. And what happened when I closed the store in uh, October of 2016, I, about a year, I think, I was semi-retired. Uh, played a lot more golf, about the, twice as much <laughs> as I normally would play, which was good. Uh, but I got a little bored and uh, realized that I needed to do something. Um, of course, fear is a motivating factor, as I told you, when you, when you don't have health insurance and you right. don't have a pension, uh, every single thing you do is coming out of your savings account. So uh, that was part of it, too. Like, oh, boy, you know, <laughs> this <laughs> retirement thing is great. But uh, so I figured I'd find my way back in. Uh, of course, I was doing real estate at the time, which was fine. I've been a licensed realtor for 37 years now. So I, I was able to do that. Uh, but I missed the jewelry business. I really sure. did. Yeah. And I, for a while, ha I had people come in here to my home, and I have a shop down in the basement, and they would come in, and, but I found that a little difficult. They would have to go downstairs and, yeah. and back up, and I was worried about security as well, and sure. so I just didn't think that was a great idea. Uh, so I happened, when I closed the store, I consigned some furniture to what a fine consignment furniture in Fairhaven. Mm -hmm. And the folks, Leif and Linda, wonderful people, I happened to know Linda before, and so I consigned furniture there. And one day I went in to get a check that they had sold a piece of mine. And as I was standing there talking to them, I said, you know, I've got an idea. And I pointed over to a corner in the shop. And I said, I, I, think, I, can, I think I can put a little jewelry shop here. And I think it would be a great symbiotic relationship because I will bring a lot of bodies to you. Sure. Uh, because I do 50 or 75, 50 to 100 watch batteries a week in my shop. I did, yeah. and now hopefully once people find out, I'll bring those people to you. And uh, when you folks go away, I've been in this business my whole life, I can manage the store when you're gone, and I think this will work out well. And they thought it was a great idea. And so that's how that happened. And I've been there for a little over four years now, and it's been a wonderful relationship. Le uh, Leif and Linda Johannesson are great people. Yes. And yes. Uh, we have a good time at work there, and, and, and it's, been, it's been great. And now I've really got a lot of customers coming back on a regular basis. And, of course, I've gained a lot of new customers from the people that came into What a Find that never knew me. Mm -hmm. So that's why I talked about the symbiotic relationship. It's really worked out well for both, I think, for both sides. And I think Leif and Linda would agree. Great. Yeah. So, so what are some things that you 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 do there? Like I you said, batteries for watches. But I, you know, what I always say, people, Charlie, uh, Charlie will. I'm, I'm sorry. Excuse me, Charlie. People will say to me, uh, "Do you do this?" I say, "Yes." Do you do that? Yes. Do you do? It? So finally, I say, "Look, if you can name it in the jewelry business, I do it." That's great. Yeah, from as simple as a watch battery to a ring guard, which I can do right in the store. Those things, watch, uh, watch bands. Um, two things that are more involved, which I have to take home with me and do in, in the shop. Uh, things like ring sizing, diamond setting, uh, necklace soldering, uh, earring repair, custom work, uh, creating something from scratch. So my Surrey Jewelry Services fake Facebook page has been a wonderful resource. Because if you go to that, you can see all the diamond rings that I do and all the, the scope of things I do, as well as surreyjewelryservices.com, okay. which also my website will show you all those things, too. Explain the history of the business and also all the things that I currently do. So, it, the, again, social media has some, some great points. It does. It, it does. does. It's got a lot of detractors, I think, but we all know that, but, yeah. but some great features. 
Yeah. And what, what are your hours of operation there? Currently, I'm in the building three days a week, Thursday from 10 to 5, Friday from 11 to 5, and Saturday from 10 to 5 as well. And those are the hours of the store. Um, I'm not there on Wednesday. However, the store is open on Wednesday, and I'm not there on Sunday. Uh, but they're, and they're closed on Monday and Tuesday. So that works out well because I need plenty of time to get the jewelry work done out of the building. Sure. And, of course, as I said, I'm also an active realtor. So I keep busy with that as I'm well. I'm sure you're very busy with that. Yeah, and that's been good with the shop too because uh, when I'm uh, when I'm in the building, we start to talk about real estate, and people say, "Oh, I have a, I have a house I'm thinking of selling," or "My daughter has a house she's selling," and of course I hand my card out, <laughs> and, and here we go. So that's worked out well too. It's you know I, I uh, people find this kind of funny, but I say they're very similar businesses, and people look at me, how can you compare jewelry to real estate? But when I'm dealing with jewelry, I'm dealing with a, a family heirloom. It could be your grandmother's ring that you're entrusting to me sure. or your engagement ring that you're entrusting to me and you want it to be done properly. And now when I give it back to you, we create that relationship. And I think uh, home sales are exactly the same thing. You have a product that you want to trust someone with and it, it happens to be a home instead of a piece of jewelry, but the, the situation is the same. You want a relationship that you can trust in. Yeah, and that's why I find them to be kind of similar. Sure. So, trusting yeah. relationship. Exactly, yeah. So uh, any other future plans? Uh, no, c to continue what I'm doing right now. That's it. Uh, do the real estate and continue doing the jewelry business. Uh, God knows what, as we know, you never know what one day is going to bring to the next, for whether it's a health situation or, yeah, right. or a family crisis or whatever. But right now, this is what I intend to do for a while. So we're going to keep going forward. And well, fun. I think that's great. I think you said it there, having fun, because you, when you enjoy what you do, and you truly do, uh, it shows, and your customers and your, the lifelong friendships that you've made, yep. you know, it really shines through. And I really, truly do. I wouldn't have gotten back into it if I didn't. Um, I did mention the finances and stuff, but that was a side note, really. Sure. Mostly yep. was I, got, I was a little bored, and I missed the customer interaction. You know, for 35, 36 straight years, I went to that store every day of my life. And all of a sudden, one day I got up and I had nowhere to go. Yep. And I had no one to talk to. You know, if my wife went off to work, yeah. I was here by myself. And I said, whoa, I, this, this is too different. <laughs> and so I found my way back into it. And it's been fantastic. So it's great. Well, Joel, we're very appreciative of your service to the community and you, for Charlie. keeping the Surrey shop alive in its own way. And thank you very much for your service to the community with MO Life. It's a wonderful organization. Thank you. And uh, as a selectman in, in Fairhaven, everyone appreciates your time. Thank and you. And we can't thank you enough as well. Oh, thank you, Joel. I appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you. Gary Valerio, class of 72, is heading to his 50-year reunion in Fairhaven by unusual method and route. Gary lives in Palmetto, Florida with his fiancée, Darla Donovan. But on April 1st, 2022, he dipped his bicycle wheel in the Pacific Ocean at his son Matthew's home in Long Beach, California. His granddaughter, Bowie, celebrated her eighth birthday by riding the first mile wearing Gary's helmet. He and Darla then embarked on a 3,000-mile bike ride across the United States. Darla, who is a critical part of this mission by being the driver of the support vehicle, throughout 90% of the ride. They plan to arrive in Fairhaven sometime in the latter part of June, and Gary will end his ride by dipping the wheel of his bike in the Atlantic Ocean at the West Island Town Beach. Gary's father, Herb Valerio, class of 51, is sure to be there as well. Gary and Darla are riding to raise awareness and money for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation in honor of Gary's sister Heidi's 28-year-old daughter, Libby Montigny, who is managing this awful disease. As of May 17th, they will be approaching Darla's hometown of Indianapolis and had raised 10% of their goal of $100,000. Gary recently became affiliated with Team Boomer and the Boomer Esiason Foundation for Cystic Fibrosis. Donations can be made by going to the website. Gary and Darla's progress can be tracked on the biking blog. You can also check out Gary Valerio on his Facebook page as well. Welcome to another edition of the magazine. Today we're here with Christine Sullivan and she is part of the project of Age Friendly. Welcome, Christine. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So tell us something about yourself and the project that you run. 
Okay, so um, I'm based at Coastline Elderly Services, and I help with the City of New Bedford's Age Friendly Project. Mm -hmm. And that's a project that really looks at all the different ways we can help older adults and disabled adults stay in their homes for as long as possible and participate in community. Excellent, thank you. Um, and so we're here today to talk about elder abuse, but why now? Why talk about elder abuse at this time? Well, June is Elder Abuse Awareness Month, and okay. it's actually recognized worldwide um, as World Elder Abuse Day on June 15th. But in the United States, we look at it throughout the entire month, and it's a particularly relevant topic this year following uh, the social isolation and all the impacts of COVID. So how big is elder abuse uh, in our community? Unfortunately, it's a lot bigger than any of us want to recognize. It's estimated in the United States that it's approximately five and a half million seniors every year wow. experience abuse, and that's nearly um, one in 10 of our population. And unfortunately as well, it's not uh, distributed evenly. Women tend to make up the larger portion of those um, abuse victims. And what, what examples of some forms of abuse that are affecting our elderly right now? Yeah. Um, so depending where you find your list, there's mm -hmm. about six primary categories that we look at. So physical abuse, and that can be the really obvious thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, bruises or broken bones or someone being slapped. But it can also incorporate things that you don't think of as often, um, physical restraint. It's not uncommon for people to be tied to their beds. Um, so that would Jeez. be one. Uh, sexual abuse is fairly self-explanatory. Uh, we see emotional abuse, psychological abuse. So that can be intimidating people, yelling at them, um, making them feel fearful in their own home. Um, and then we also have uh, financial abuse. And mm -hmm. I think we have all heard the scam phone calls, right? Sure. Um, you know, Amazon's gonna close your account if you don't call right away, mm -hmm. or um, something about your social security and it's some garbled message. But beyond that, um, we see older adults being taken advantage of perhaps by members of their family or caregivers who gain access to their bank accounts mm. and start spending their money and, and then maybe the rent's not paid or there's signs that something's going wrong there. Uh, and then the final uh, category, which is a big one, is neglect. So that might be that the um, senior expects someone to be caring for them um, and they're not. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're actively neglecting them. And the last category that I find the most difficult to explain really or to understand is self-neglect. And that's when a person's just really not able to care for themselves anymore. And there's a fine line there between a person having the right to determine their own life and right. their own priorities and their own future. And when do you intervene? and say, now this person is at risk and the situation has become dangerous. So if there is an elder that's watching this and they do feel like they're being abused by a family member or a caregiver and they are afraid, what should they do? They should call the hotline that we discussed, 1-800-922-2275 uh, and report it. And if they don't feel comfortable doing that, call your counsel on aging. Okay. and speak with the outreach worker and just tell them you need help and explain your situation and you will find really very caring and competent people are available to help. Very good, thank you. Elder abuse is considered a, a social justice issue. Do you agree with that? I do and it's a term that's getting tossed around a lot these days and I feel as though the definition on it has gotten a little um, squishy, hard to pin down. <laughs> but if we think about social justice as giving everybody the ability to participate in society equally, then this is a justice issue. And it is social because there's things that all of us can do to help provide a safe environment for folks of all ages. Excellent, thank you. So what can we do as a community to uh, prevent elder abuse? 
So I'd say at the individual level, what you can do is stay in contact with the older people in your life, whether that's a neighbor or somebody you run into at the grocery store or a family member. Simply checking in and helping to reduce that social isolation makes a big difference mm -hmm. so that you can be that trusted person if something's going on, you recognize it, and you can look for help. At a broader scale, I would encourage folks to support the programs that support our older adults. So whether that means supporting a program at your Council on Aging, if you have time to volunteer, or the way you vote to support programs, mm -hmm. this all mm -hmm. makes a really big difference that we include all members of our society and give them a chance to succeed. Thank you. So June is Elder Abuse Awareness Month. It is. What is the driving point that you'd like everyone that is watching this to hear? The driving point I would make is stay connected to the older adults in your life so that you're available or so that you can recognize when something is wrong. Great. So uh, after June and this month that we're creating a lot of awareness, is there anything else coming up this year that uh, we need to be aware of for our senior population? Well, hopefully we're seeing the lightening up of COVID restrictions and that there's going to be a lot of opportunities out in community mm -hmm. to get people out and moving and engaged again. I worry that we all got a little used to hanging out at home for the last year and a half right. and it's become a habit. Mm -hmm. And so if you have people in your life that are a little reluctant to re-engage, bring them with you. Go find something to do and bring along a friend. It's going to be tough to get reintegrated into our community, but not impossible. Well, I think we're all looking forward to yeah. it. <laughs> well, absolutely. Well, Christine, I want to thank you for coming and, and speaking about the, the warning signs, what we can do as a community uh, to prevent elder abuse as best as possible. And once again, uh, could you share the hotline number uh, for us for um, if anyone is watching and they, they feel troubled by that, at least they can call this number and just work through it and talk it out and maybe they can get resources. So the hotline number at the state level is 1-800-922-2275, and that report will go to Bristol Elder Services. If you'd like to report or just get some advice on the situation locally, I would advise you to call your local council on aging. And in Fairhaven, that number is 508-979-4029, and in New Bedford, it is 508 508- 991-6251. Well, in Fairhaven, uh, I know for sure that we have a very strong Council on Aging, a very active Council on Aging. In New Bedford, also very yeah. strong, and also cushion it yes. for our residents of every, every All the uh, cities or towns around here are very strong, very active councils. So there are resources out there for our community and uh, for our elders. And it's important, you know, that we respect our elders, as we've always been told. Um, because we'll be there someday. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, all right. Well, thank you, Christine, uh, for giving us great information, great resources on Elder Abuse Awareness Month. And thank you for having me. Thank you.